Hello and welcome back to Math and Bolt. This is lecture number 11 on the series on classical mechanics. So far, we have been discussing on central forces. So this is also a continuation on central forces. Uh, what we have done is we have used a very special type of central force by the name of inverse square law and we obtained that the part is elliptical in nature. We also define several parameters of an ellipse such as the semi-lattice rectum, eccentricity, semi-major and minor axis. Well, with all the knowledge, we begin our journey on Kepler's law of planetary motion. Tycho Brahe was a very famous Dennis astronomer. He was uh, working in the 16th century and he had an assistant by the name of Johannes Kepler, who was a German astronomer. Now, both of them had a very perfect blend of abilities because the telescope wasn't created until a few years after Brahe passed away. However, he was able to measure planetary positions to an accuracy of 0.01 degree only with the help of his naked eye. Kepler, who had the mathematical ingenuity and the bravery to realize the three planetary empirical rules, and he used it to suit Brahe's measurement. The assignment was very daunting, uh, and it took him almost 18 years and hard calculation to realize the three laws of planetary motion. So let me state uh, the three laws of planetary motion given by Kepler. So these are the three planetary laws of motion as given by Kepler. Let's talk about each of the three planetary motion one by one. So we have an elliptical part. This elliptical part is going to have two focus. Assuming that the sun centered around any one of us foci of the ellipse, then it's found that the planet is always going to follow an elliptical path as shown in the figure. Now coming to the second law, so we have equal areas are swept in equal amounts of time by the radius vector from the sun to a planet. So we have the sun present at one of the foci at S and we have a planet. Let's suppose it's at this is at particular time t1. So we join the planet and the sun with a straight line. So this is the radius vector. And let's suppose that at time t2, our planet it has a new location on the elliptical path. So this much area is swept by the planet. So let's call this area as a1. Now let's say after a certain period of time at t3, so this is the new location of the planet. And at T4, let's say it's at this particular location. So it's going to sweep out a new area. So let this area be A2. So this particular uh, the law states that the area A1 divided by T2 minus T1. So that's equals to area A2 divided by T4 minus T3. In other words, we can say that the rate of change of area, this is always a constant. Now let's try to prove that. So we have this elliptical part, we'll consider A1. So let's have a, so this is our area A1. So this much angle is d theta. This length is r, so dr, so this will be r d theta, which is the arc length. Now, the area, area will be, so the small incremental area, da1, so that will be equals to half base, so our base is r times the altitude, which is dr. So if we substitute the value of dr with r d theta, so we have half r squared d theta, so this is d a1. Now, the rate of change of area, or simply the aerial velocity, and that will be given by half r squared times d theta over d t, which is the rate of change of angle theta. If you recall, the angular momentum L was given by m r squared d theta over T, d, t. So that means if we pull out r squared d theta over dt, then we have L over 
m. The rate of change of area d1 over dt, so that simply equals to half. So we have r, so that will be l divided by m. So l over 2m, we know that l is a conserved quantity, so l is constant. Mass is also going to be fixed, so that means dA1 over dT1, so the rate of change of area, this is always going to be a fixed constant quantity. So this is what Kepler's second law of planetary motion states that equal areas are swept in an equal amount of time by the radius vector from the sun drawn to the planet. Let's come to the third one. So the third law states that t squared equals to k times a cube, where k is a constant for all planets. This relates to period of revolution t of a planet around the sun to the major axis a of the ellipse the time period or the period of revolution of the planet around the sun in an elliptical path that will be given by area divided by the aerial velocity we know that the area of an ellipse because since this is an elliptical path so that will be pi times a b where a is the length of the semi major axis and b is the length of the semi minor axis divided by the aerial velocity which is da over dt now we have already obtained the value of da over dt so this is pi a b divided by l over 2m so that means we have 2 pi m a over l times b now recall from our previous discussion on conic sections we obtained that the value of b was given by a times square root of 1 minus the centricity epsilon squared so we replace this value in place of b so it means our time period t will be then given by 2 pi m over l we have an a here already a times a times square root of 1 minus epsilon squared so this is the value of b so that means our value of t is equals to 2 pi m over l we have a squared times square root of 1 minus epsilon squared now we're going to square both sides so squaring both sides gives us t squared is equals to 4 pi squared m squared over l squared times a raised to the power of 4 times 1 minus epsilon squared so t squared will be equals to 4 pi squared m squared l squared so a raised to the power of 4 can be written as a cubed times a times 1 minus epsilon squared this we have done this because this is actually the value of a semi latest rectum which is l that means l is equals to a times 1 minus epsilon squared so we can replace this with l so we have t squared given by 4 pi squared so we have m squared be l divided by l squared times a cube so here we can see that the mass the lattice rectum the l all of these are constant so we can say that t squared is proportional to a cube so this is our kepler's third law of motion or we can also rewrite this as t squared equals to k times a cube where k is the constant given by 4 pi squared m squared l over l squared from kepler's first law we have shown that a planet will orbit about the sun's center of mass m in an elliptical path with the sun centered at one of its foci now this law arises as a consequence of considering the force center to be stationary meaning let's say so we have a fixed center o and then we have a object of mass m which is at a distance r away from this fixed center and it would be moving in some kind of path above this center o now the forced f which is completely a function of the distance joining the point o and the particle so that could be either directing towards this center o if it is an attractive force or it could be pointing away from the center o if it is a repulsive force so we have used the inverse square law of force which was given by k over r squared to derive the Kepler's laws if we refer to this particular diagram then O represents the Sun's position 
and this particle is represented by the planet Earth, which is revolving about the Sun. Now, there are a couple of things that we can draw out of this observation. The first being that the gravitational force of attraction that is going to be acting along the lines joining the center of masses and it is always going to be attractive in nature. And the next thing is the Earth, because the Earth is revolving around the Sun in an elliptical path, the Earth is going to experience a gravitational pull of the Sun. But the thing is, the Sun is also going to experience some kind of gravitational force due to the Earth. That means the Earth is also going to exert a gravitational pull on the Sun and that is a consequence of Newton's third law of motion. However, for our calculation purpose, what we have done is we have neglected this effect, neglected the gravitational effect of Earth on the Sun and we consider the Sun's position to be stationary. Only that the Earth is uh, moving under the influence of the gravitational pull of the Sun in an elliptical part. Now, what we need to do is we need to check whether this is a valid assumption or not because although the force of attraction experienced by the Sun due to the Earth might be very minuscule, we have to consider the fact that the Sun is surrounded by several planets in the solar system. And as a result, the net force experienced by the Sun due to the presence of Earth or any other planets may not be very small and there is a good chance that the Sun's position is also shifting. In fact, the simulation below shows the actual movement of the Sun through space. So let us begin our discussion on the two-body system. So for this, we are going to consider a particle of mass m and another particle of mass m2. Now, we'll consider another center, a fixed center O. And with respect to the center O, the position vector, which is the vector that connects the fixed center and the object, that, object of mass m1, m1, let that be denoted by r1 vector. And M2 has a position vector of, say, R2 vector. Also, we are going to connect the two masses. That means the distance between them is denoted by R vector. Now, if we apply the triangle law of vector addition, it's clear that R vector will be equals to R1 vector minus R2 vector. Let this be equation number one. And if we take the time derivative of both sides, then this will give us r vector dot equals to r1 dot minus r2 dot. And again, taking the time derivative, we have r double dot equals to r1 double dot minus r2 double dot. So let this be equation number two. Now let's talk about the forces experienced by these two. So due to mass m1, due to mass m1, m2 is going to experience a force. So we can say force experienced by 2, that is object of mass m2, due to 1. So that will be given by f to 1 and this is going to be directed towards m1 uh, because it's an attractive force. However, I made a mistake while drawing the arrow. So the arrow should be pointing towards m1 so it should go from m2 towards m1 then we have the force experienced by particle of mass m1 due to 2 in a similar fashion this force is also going to be pointing towards m2 that means it's going to be directed from m1 towards m2 and not as it is shown in the figure here so please be careful with that so that means as a consequence of newton's third law of motion we can say that f 1 2 vector so that will be equals to negative f 2 1 vector because magnitude wise both of them are going to be the same let's call this equation number three and this is the internal force this is the internal force acting on the two particles of mass m1 and m2 so similarly we are also going to have an external force so let's say the external force at experienced by mass m1 so that is f1 external 
So these are like forces that are acting on it M1 due to other objects that might be surrounding this two-body system. Then we have similarly for object F mass M2, it will be experienced an external force F2 external. So these are all the forces experienced by this particular two-body system. So let's call this, I'm going to name it. So let's call this object of mass M1 situated at point A and object of mass 2 is situated at point B. Now at point A, let's apply the first law or write the equation of motion. So we have M1 R1 double dot. So that will be equals to F one two so this is the internal force plus the external force right so what we'll do let's multiply throughout by m2 so we'll have m1 times m2 r1 vector double dot equals to m1 f12 plus uh, we multiply it with m2 so this will be m2 plus m2 times f1 external so we're going to call it equation number three why we have multiplied with m2 throughout that will become evident in a moment at point b so we have m2 r2 vector double dot so this will be equals to the internal force f21 vector plus the external force f and this time we're going to multiply throughout with m1 so we have m1 times m2 times r2 double dot that will be equals to m1 times f21 vector plus m1 times f2 external force and we're going to call it equation number four and what we'll do we'll subtract equation number four from equation number three let's do that we have m1 times m2 we have r1 vector double dot minus r2 vector double dot so that's equals to m2 times f12 vector minus m1 times f21 vector plus m2 times f1 external minus m1 times f2 external now what we'll do we'll use equation number two so in equation number two r1 vector double dot minus r2 double dot so that will be replaced with simply r double dot and also we use the fact that f12 that f12 vector that's equals to negative of f21 vector so if we use this fact then this will become simply m2 plus m1 multiplied to f12 vector now what we'll do in the third and the fourth term we're going to take m1 times m2 as the common vector so that leaves us with f1 external divided by m1 minus f2 external divided by m2 this particular term is the acceleration of mass m1 due to the external force f1 and this is the acceleration of mass m2 due to the presence of an external force f2 since our central force are conservative in nature we are going to assume that this external forces is not going to affect the internal force between the two particles m1 and m2 but it is only letting it move from one position to the another as a whole system in other words it is producing an equal acceleration in both the two particles then what happens is like these two terms are going to cancel out each other and we are left with m1 m2 times r vector double dot equals to m1 plus m2 times f 
1 to vector. And if we rewrite them, what we have is f1 to vector. So that's equals to m1 times m2 whole divided by m1 plus m2 times r vector double dot and this particular term this can be represented by mu where mu stands for m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2 and this particular term is known as the effective mass or the reduced mass if we replace this f12 vector with a more generalized version so f vector will be equals to mu times r vector and this reduced mass or the effective mass is actually the center of mass of the two body system that we have considered and that particular and this particular effective mass will be placed somewhere in between m1 and m2 and it's going to have let me write it down uh, this is r1 vector r2 vector the center of mass is going to lie somewhere in between m1 and m2 and it's going to have a coordinate given by r vector and this r vector will be m1 r1 vector plus m2 r2 vector divided by m1 plus m2 so this is the coordinate of the center of mass and the center of mass is simply denoted by mu which is the product of the two masses divided by their sums now you know, coming back to a problem of the kepler's two body problem where we consider the system comprising of the sun and the earth so we'll consider that m2 represents the sun's mass and suppose m1 represents earth's mass now we know that the mass of the sun which is going to be much larger compared to that of the earth's mass so in that case our reduced mass then will become so we have mu is equals to so we have m1 times m2 what we'll do let's keep it as m1 times m2 divided by we'll take m2 as the common factor in the denominator we have m1 over m2 plus 1 so the m2 m2 gets cancelled from both the numerator and the denominator so mu will be equals to m1 divided by m1 over m2 plus 1 and since m2 is very huge compared to m1 so in the denominator m1 over m2 that ratio is going to be zero and our effective mass or the reduced mass will be approximately m1 fine and coming to the position of the center of mass so here what we'll have so let's take m2 as the common factor in the numerator so we have m1 over m2 times r1 vector plus r2 vector all divided by so we'll take m2 in the denominator as well so we have m1 over m2 plus 1 so immediately we can say m m2 gets factored out from the numerator and the denominator also m1 over m2 so this ratio is going to be zero since m2 is much much larger compared to m1 so that means our position of the center of mass that becomes equals to r2 vector so this essentially means only one thing so that means when we consider one mass which is m2 to be extremely larger or dominating compared to the other mass the mass of the earth then we see that the reduced mass the reduced mass will be equivalent to m1 so that means our force of equ our equation of motion or you can say the force equation reduces to m1 times r vector double dot so we only have to consider the mass of the object that is moving around the larger object that is going to give us the equation of motion and the center of mass the position of the center of mass shifts towards the bigger mass so that means now our origin has now shifted to to the larger mass so what we started out with the assumption that the sun which is the fixed which is sitting at the fixed center or the fixed foci of the ellipse is actually a true proposition so this is what we wanted to show